Heavenly Father, we come before you today as a people of great need. Lord, there are surely some here today who have no faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that through the ministry of your word, you might be pleased even today to call many to yourself and grant faith to believe and be saved. And Lord, we acknowledge that there are many here who do believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as a Savior and Lord, and yet we struggle to believe and to trust you fully in the face of life's difficulties. We believe, O Lord, but we cry out, help our unbelief. And we pray that you would strengthen us even today to walk in the obedience of faith, come what may. We commit our way to you and we ask that you would be pleased to work in us and through us for your glory and for our good. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you're able, I ask that you would remain standing for the reading of God's holy word. We continue in our sermon series through the book of Romans. And this morning we come to Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 34. Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 34. I ask that you would listen carefully as I read, for this is the very word of God. The apostle Paul writes, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. May the Lord bless to our hearts and minds the reading of his word, and you may be seated. Well, there is a strange struggle that is often present in the Christian life. Uh, you might call it the, the struggle for a functional faith. The struggle goes something like this, that as Christians, by definition, we believe that God can do and in fact has done the great cosmic works of creation and salvation. We believe it. We confess it. But at the very same time, we often struggle to believe that God can do the the mundane work of helping us through our present day trials. God spoke the very cosmos into existence. We say, yes, I believe that. The son of God provides atonement for the sins of the world and has been raised from the dead. Yes, I believe that. God will someday usher all of his people into heaven where we will dwell with God forever in sinless perfection? Yes, I believe that. But to trust that God will see me through a stressful situation at work this coming Tuesday? I don't know, we say that. That, that seems pretty difficult. That God might help me pursue reconciliation and healing in a difficult relationship? Oh, I don't know. That seems very overwhelming, even impossible. That God would enable me to persevere and press on in, in joyful obedience, even in the face of illness, persecution, failure and disappointment. Oh, I don't know about that, preacher. That that seems a bridge too far. You see, if we are Christians, we have saving faith. We believe in the, the fundamentals of the gospel message. But often we struggle to find functional faith. Faith to trust and obey God today. We, we somehow find it easier to believe that God made the world out of nothing and raised Jesus from the dead then we believe that God is sovereignly at work today. 
providing what we need to get through the trials of today. I, I call it, it's a rather crude term, but bear with me, the struggle for functional faith. Now, what we have here in the book of Romans is, is that Paul is, is clearly yearning for all Christians to have this kind of functional faith. He wants us to believe in the gospel message, the particular details of the gospel. He wants us to believe that message to be sure. But he wants us to believe in a, in a full and transforming way that would bring about the obedience of faith every day. He not only wants us to believe in the gospel for our eternal salvation, but he wants us to live, really live each day by faith. Here in the latter half of Romans 8, we see that Paul is calling us to believe in the great doctrines of salvation that he's been teaching throughout the letter the doctrine of justification and union with Christ and definitive and progressive sanctification and glorification. But he wants us to believe in these truths in a way that gives us strength to live and face the trials and tribulations of today and the next day and the next day. This morning, then, as part of this quest for functional faith, we turn to Romans 8, 31 through 34. And as we consider these four verses, we will do so in three parts. First part I am titling, A Clarification of These Things. The second part, An Application of These Things. And finally, A Confirmation of of these things. A clarific, clarification, application, and confirmation of these things. And I am convinced if we have ears to hear what Paul is saying in these verses, we will find our faith strengthened in very functional ways to face the challenges of today. Let's consider each of these three parts in turn. So first we have a clarification of these things. We see that in verse 31, Paul begins by saying, what then shall we say to these things? Which causes us to ask, what things? What is Paul talking about? Well, to clarify what Paul means here, we have to go back to what Paul has been saying in the previous verses. In the previous verses, Paul has been arguing that the, the content of the gospel really transforms our experience of suffering. But Paul acknowledges that in this life, we face sufferings of various kinds. We face painful groanings that come from living in a fallen world. And we face the internal and external weakness that results from the consequence of sin. These sufferings, these groanings, these weaknesses, in short, make life hard. And the hardness of life has the potential to make the, the gospel of God and, and God himself feel small. And yet Paul counters here in Romans 8 that in the midst of this hardship, the hope of the gospel and the glory of God truly shines through to the believer. Paul tells us that in the midst of the believer's suffering and groaning and weakness, the Holy Spirit is actively interceding for us. That is, the Holy Spirit is personally and perfectly appealing to the Father according to the will of God. And what we've discussed together is that in this intercession, the, the Holy Spirit is appealing for God the Father to complete in us the great and glorious plan of salvation that he set in motion before the beginning of time. And Paul here in Romans in these last couple of verses have, has reminded us of this glorious plan. That God has foreknown and elected his children before the foundation of the world. He has predestined history and all of our individual steps to lead us to salvation. 
according to his predestined plan in the fullness of time, God effectually called us to believe in the gospel message. He worked faith in us so that we believed. And by faith, he justified us through the gift of the imputed righteousness of Christ. And for all those he has foreknown and predestined and called and justified by faith, God has been and is now and will be at work, causing all things to work together for our ultimate spiritual good. And that good of then is is nothing less, Paul says, than full conformity to the very image of Christ. And this providential working in and through all things to conform us to the image of Christ, Paul says, it will culminate in the eternal glorification of the believer. We could say it this way, that God has begun a good work in every believer. He will bring that work to completion and he is actively at work, even now working all things to this glorious end. So that we can say with confidence, the ultimate work of the believer's salvation cannot fail. This is the these things that Paul has been speaking about just in the past few verses. If you weren't here last week, I encourage you to go back and read verses 26 through 30. What Paul is telling us in no uncertain terms is that God has a definite plan for the salvation of all of his people. It is a plan formed in eternity past. It extends to eternity future. And God is intimately involved in every present moment in the life of every Christian to bring this plan to full fruition. So now that we have a clear sense of what Paul means by these things, we see that what Paul then wants to do in our verses, verses 31 through 34, is he wants to take the truth of these things and he wants to apply it to our lives in very targeted ways. This then brings us to the second portion of our sermon, the application of these things. And Paul endeavors to apply these truths to our life by by forcing us to wrestle with some rhetorical questions. These questions make us wrestle with the implication of these things so that we we are forced to apply these truths to our present day circumstances. The first rhetorical question is, if God is for us, who can be against us? In, In essence, Paul is taking the entire content of these things from the previous verses, and he is summing it up with a little statement, God is for us. The sum of God choosing to foreknow and predestine and call and justify and glorify the believer. The sum of the Holy Spirit actively interceding for us in every trial and groan. The sum of God causing all things to work for the believer's conformity to Christ. The sum of all that taken together is the declaration. God is most definitely for us as believers. He has been for us before we were ever born. He will be for us for all eternity. And he is actively for us right now. Now, Paul poses this as a hypothetical, just I think to provoke us to consider the matter more fully. God says, if God is for us, And yet we see very clearly that for Paul, the weight of these things makes the case very clear. God is most certainly for us. From eternity past to eternity future and every moment in between. And if God is for us, Paul says, well then, who can be against us? And now again, as we've seen in previous verses, Paul is not naive. He is well acquainted and has pointed out in the text the sufferings, groanings, and weaknesses of this life. And he knows that in this suffering, groaning, weak life, there are many arrayed against us. For starters, Paul knows that Satan is against the believer. Scripture says, Satan roams about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Devour. 
with his evil schemes. And Paul knows that the world is often arrayed against the believer. Jesus himself said to his disciples, if the world hates you, and it does and it will, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. And Jesus continues, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. So Paul knows Satan is against the believer. The world is against the believer. And at times we are even against ourselves. We can tear ourselves down with all all kinds of internal accusations and self-loathing and even self-harm. Now, many are arrayed against us. As Luther said, this world with devils filled threatens to undo us. And often in our sufferings and our groaning and our weakness and the recognition of all the things that are against us, we cry out, ah, the world and the flesh and the devil are against me. What can I do? But Paul says here, well, you and and I, we, we can apply these things to our lives. And by doing so, we can know And we can believe that in the midst of all the forces arrayed against us, God is for us. He chose us before the foundations of the world. He foreknew us, predestined us, called us, justified us, and he intercedes for us even now. He is causing all things to work together for our ultimate spiritual good so that the world and the flesh and the devil, what they intend for evil He works even that for our good. And that good will culminate in our glory, where we will be perfectly and eternally conformed to the image of humanity, the very humanity of Jesus Christ. I want to ask you to ask yourself here, can the world and the flesh and the devil revoke the eternal counsels and decrees of God? Of course not. Can they stop his predestination to bring his children to salvation? No. Can they thwart the effectual call of his people? No. Can they renounce or revoke or remove God's declaration of justification in Christ? No. Can the world, the flesh, and the gates of hell effectively stand against God's forward march to bring about the glorification of every believer? No. Ultimately, all their opposition is fruitless and futile in the face of God's eternal plan to bring about the salvation of his people. The world, the flesh, and the devil, they can't win. They're already defeated. And Paul wants us to have a very functional faith as we face the trials and hardships of this life. To be able to say, yes, there are many arrayed against us. But if God is for us, and he most certainly is, who can ultimately stand against us? Who can ultimately thwart his purposes for us? Answer, nobody. So Paul would would call us to believe in these things today and to stand firm and to press on in faithful obedience today, come what may, knowing, believing that these things are true. This gives way to another rhetorical question, which drives the application of these things deeper into our hearts. Paul says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Paul here is challenging us with some basic logic, right? He's trying to get us to think from the greater to the lesser. If this is true, how much more is this true? And in doing this, Paul is challenging the the foolish, the even dare I say silly tendency that we have as Christians to 
to believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ as a, a great historical event that brings about our salvation, and yet to doubt God's goodness and active work in our present circumstances. Paul says, reconsider for a moment what God has done for you, what I know you believe. Paul says, God did not spare his own son. Despite the unspeakable and unfathomable love that has existed from all eternity between the father and the son, a love that stands at the very being and essence of God, despite this, God the father did not spare his son the horrors of the cross. Even as the son pleaded with the father with, with perfect and noble courage, asking, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but your will be done. Even in this perfect love, even in the face of this perfect plea, God did not spare his own son. But he commanded him to endure the cross. And despise the shame. He did not spare the son from the rage of Satan and the onslaught of demonic evil. He did not spare him from the hatred of the world and the mockery of the crowds and the physical barbarity of the cross. And what is more striking, the father did not spare the son from his own holy wrath. As Isaiah writes, it pleased the father to crush the son in holy judgment. Oh, the son turned black at noonday because the father did not spare the son from the horrors of the cross. And we ask, why did the father not spare the son? Paul tells us, because on the cross, the father gave the son for us all. For all who believe, for all whom God foreknew and predestined and called and justified and glorified, for all the ones that God is indeed for, he gave up his son to suffer and die for our sin in our place. We sing how great the pain of searing loss. The father turned his face away. We marvel as the son cried out, my Lord, my Lord, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The answer is, he did it for you. He did it for you, believer. He did it because he is eternally and presently for you. He chose to know you in Christ before the foundation of the world. He predestined you to be found in Christ. He called you to believe in Christ. He justified you by imputing to you the very righteousness of Christ. He is even now working all things to conform you to the image of Christ. He will glorify you and make you fully like Christ as you see Jesus face to face so that you can know right now as you face sufferings and groanings and weakness, right now as you are tempted to, to doubt the presence of God, the goodness of God, or his work in your present circumstances, Paul wants you to ask yourself, if God did not spare his own son from the horrors of the cross, but gave him up for you, if Jesus, and suffered, if Jesus suffered and died to save you from all eternity, will God not now give you everything you need for your spiritual good today? Now, of course, when the text says God will graciously give us all things, we need to read that in context, right? God is not a genie in a bottle that will grant us all of our arbitrary wishes for earthly success. Thank the Lord. But rather, it is clear in perfect wisdom, 
He who saved us through the life, death, and resurrection of his son will graciously give us everything we need to be made like Jesus, to conform us to the image of the son. In every suffering, in every groan, in every weakness, Paul says, know this believer, believe it. God is for you. He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for you. And he did not do that in order to leave you as an orphan today. He will give you what you need to make you like Jesus. And we can believe these things today. And we can stand firm. And press on in the obedience of faith, come what may. The final rhetorical questions are are very much in the vein of the previous ones. Paul asks, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies who is to condemn. Now, of course, once again, Paul knows many people, in fact, bring charges against God's elect. Satan is known in the scripture as the great accuser of the brethren. Revelation 12. The world brings charges against believers every day, right? Jesus tells his disciples in Matthew 5, the world will revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil about you falsely on my account. And again, even our own hearts can bring charges against us. We say to ourselves, you're not good enough. You'll never measure up. God will never accept you or be pleased with you. After what you have done, there is no forgiveness. There is no hope. Paul says in in the face of all these charges, which are, are arrayed against us every day, remind yourself of this. Who has the power to justify? Can Satan ultimately determine who is in the right with God? Does the world have the power to make that declaration? Do you? Are you the sovereign king and judge of the universe? No, no, praise God, no. Only God, the creator, sustainer, and redeemer, he alone is the one who justifies. Only God has the power to say in a definitive way, not Guilty. Well done. Good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. On the great day when you stand before God, it will not matter what Satan says or what the world says. It will not even matter what you say about yourself. All that will matter is what God says, what God declares, who God says is in the right. Because God alone justifies. And here is what God has said in his word. That on our own, we're all sinners. And none of us have the ability to stand before God in our own strength. But God has sent his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus has perfectly lived. He's lived the perfectly righteous life that we should have lived, but didn't live and couldn't live. But Jesus lived for us in our place. And this perfect, holy Jesus then died for us in our place. He took all our sin upon himself and paid the penalty for our sin. He died for us as we have already sung. Jesus paid it all. And now the scripture says, all who believe in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, God takes all our sin and he puts it on Jesus. And he takes all of Christ's righteousness and he gives it to us. So that when we stand before God as believers, we are declared to be righteous, just, in the right before God. God alone is the one who justifies. And Paul has already told us in Romans 3 that God is just 
and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So, so I, I warn you, if you do not believe in the one and only son, it does not matter what Satan says about you. It does not matter what the world thinks about you. And it does not matter what you think about yourself. If you do not believe in the only Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be condemned by God. As John 3.18 says, whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. But praise the Lord, if you do believe in the Lord Jesus Christ... As John 3, 16 and 18 says, you will not perish, but have everlasting life. For whoever believes in him, in Christ, is not condemned. And here's the great news. If God justifies you, if he justifies you according to his precious promises on the basis of the life, death, and resurrection of his most precious son, then who is to condemn? Answer? No, it does not matter what Satan says. It does not matter what the world says. It it doesn't even matter what your own anxious heart says. God justifies no one is to condemn. And what this means is that as we face the sufferings and the groanings and the weakness of this life on this day or any day and every day, we can believe That God is for us from eternity past to eternity future. That God justifies the believer right now in Christ. And he will declare us to be in the right on the last day. He will declare this before the eyes of the watching world and before all the principalities and powers. So that right now we can believe in him and persevere, and press on in in functional faith, the obedience of faith, come what may. This then brings us to the final part of our sermon where Paul, we've already seen, Paul clarifies these things. He applies these things with his rhetorical questions. And finally, he confirms these things to us. How does he do this? He does this by restating these glorious truths in a precise and direct manner. He begins by saying, Christ Jesus is the one who died, right? As we've already explored, he died for all our sin in our place. He paid it all. He was not spared the horrors of the cross. And this was so that all who believe in him would be spared from the condemning judgment of God. We are not condemned because Christ Jesus is the one who died. But Paul continues, more than that, he says, who was raised. As glorious and as central as the death of Jesus is for our salvation, without the resurrection, it would be empty and pointless. Because if Jesus had died and then remained dead, He would not have defeated the world and the sinful flesh and the devil, but they would have triumphed over him. If Jesus remained in death, he could not save us from death. And we would know that all his claims to save us are groundless and empty. Why? Because he's dead. But as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, If Christ is not raised from the dead, our preaching is in vain. Your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Death is the victor and Christians are to be pitied among all people as fools. But praise God that Jesus not only died for our sin, but more than that, he was raised from the dead. In his resurrection, he triumphed over sin and death and hell. His resurrection ultimately frees us from the penalty and power of sin, and it gives us eternal hope. For it is the eternal, indestructible, and incorruptible resurrection life of Jesus that we are being conformed into. So Paul is right to say Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that who was raised. But he continues, having been raised, we declare from the scriptures he has ascended 
into heaven. And as Paul says here, he is seated at the right hand of God. Many of you will know the right hand is the symbolic position where rule and authority is invested. So Paul is declaring here, Jesus not only lived for us on earth, he not only died for us and rose for us, but he now lives and reigns over us. Jesus is the king. Not just someday, but today. And this is a source of great functional faith to face the trials of life. For Jesus not only lived and died and was raised 2,000 years ago, but he lives and rules and reigns over us today. And from his glorious exalted position at the right hand of the Father, he causes all things to work together for our ultimate spiritual good. And today, the text says, he's not only ruling and reigning over us, but even one better, he is actively praying for us, interceding for our needs before the Father. It's marvelous, brothers and sisters. Jesus lived for us, died for us, rose for us. He rules and reigns over us for our good. And he actively prays for us even now. Along with the Holy Spirit, Jesus intercedes for us according to the will of God. Jesus prays that we would receive everything we need for our sanctification, for our conformity to his image, for our glorification before his face. He pleads his own righteousness before the throne of grace so that we are accepted by the Father. Ah, in love and in grace, God has foreknown us, chosen us, predestined us, purchased our salvation through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. God has called us to believe. He's freely justified us in Christ. And Christ now rules and reigns over us. And God is causing all things to work together for our ultimate conformity to the image of the Son. And in the midst of it all, Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit are actively interceding for us. Asking the Father for everything we need to be made into the image of Christ. And in light of all this, I think we can rightly say what Paul has already said here in Romans 8, right? That the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. That we can say with Paul, that God is for us so that no one can ultimately stand against us. God gave us Jesus so he will ultimately give us everything we need to be made like Jesus. God justifies us. No one can condemn us. And my prayer for us today is that these things would be a powerful source of a very functional faith. A faith that not only believes we will go to heaven someday, but a faith that enables us to live boldly and courageously and obediently today. That we might be able to face all of the sufferings and the groanings and the weakness of this life, but to face it with a faith that perseveres and hopes and abounds in joy and presses on. That we would have a faith that gives us real strength for present day obedience right now, come what may. Brothers and sisters, this is a glorious truth. The God who began a good work in us will most certainly see that work through to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. And he is for us today, at work for our good today, ruling and reigning over us today, praying for us today. So let us trust him today and follow him in functional, faithful obedience today and every day until that great day, a day which is surely coming. And even so, we pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, grant us the faith to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
to not only believe in what he has done for our salvation, but to believe in what he is doing even right now, ruling, reigning, and interceding for us. Help us to believe that you not only have done a great work for our salvation and you not only will do a great work for our salvation, but that you are actively at work in all of our trials, in all of our suffering, in all of our groanings, in all of our weakness. You're actively at work to work all things for our good, our conformity to the very image of Jesus Christ. Help us to believe this and to press on with a very functional, life-giving obedience, even today. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.